All rise, we will obey. The International Criminal Court is now in session. Lodian Sala Corporal International, eight word. Please be seated. Bye bye, Susua. Bonjour. Oui, Madame la Présidente, Mesdames les Juges, nous sommes dans la situation en République centrafricaine, dans l'affaire Les Procureurs contre Jean-Pierre Bemba Gombo, numéro de l'affaire ICC 01050108, et nous sommes en audience publique, Madame la Présidente. I'm really sorry for that. The Chamber would like also to greet the representatives of the Democratic Republic of Congo, representatives of non-governmental organizations, family members, Mr. Bemba, members of the Corps Diplomatique, judges, court staff, and other individuals in the public gallery. The Chamber assumes that, as always, the public in the gallery will be respectful towards the Chamber throughout the reading of the present judgment. And I would just remind them to abstain from making any sort of manifestations during the present hearing. My most warm welcome to the court interpreters, the court reporters. And to begin with, I would like to ask the attendees of this hearing to introduce themselves and their teams, starting by the prosecution team, and I recognize Ms. Fatou Ben Souda, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, honorable judges, the Office of the Prosecutor is represented today by the Deputy Prosecutor, James Stewart, Senior Trial Lawyer, Jean-Jacques Badibanga, Trial Lawyers, Massimo Scaliotti, Eric Iverson, Skelson Zanelli, Thomas Bifoli, Horeja Balagay, Legal Assistant, Sanyu, Ndagire, case manager, Sylvie Vindina, and international cooperation advisor, Abdul Aziz Mbai, and myself, Fatu Pensuda, prosecutor. Thank you very much, Madam Bensuda. I now turn to the defense team, Mr. Haynes. Um, good afternoon, Your Honor. The defendant is represented this afternoon by myself, Peter Haynes, my co-counsel, Kate Gibson, 
and Melinda Taylor, and our case managers, Cecile Lecol and Nash Natasha Labondre. Thank you very much, Mr. Haynes. I would ask the legal representative of victims to introduce herself and her team. Je vous remercie, Madame le Président. Je suis moi-même Marie Edith Douzima Lawson, représentante légale des victimes, assistée de Maître Célestin Nzala, assistant juridique, et de Evelyne Ombeni, caisse manager, ainsi que Mélanie Liode Vianney, caisse manager. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Maître Douzima. Representative of the Registry. Merci, Madame la Présidente, Madame les Juges. Sur le banc du greffe avec moi aujourd'hui, il y a Vera Wank, juriste coordinatrice, et donc moi-même, Marc Dubuisson, directeur des services judiciaires qui représente Herman Van Ebel, le greffier. Thank you very much. As a preliminary matter, and before reading out the summary of today's judgment, the Chamber will issue a short oral decision on two pending defense requests for leave to appeal. The first pending request is the defense request for leave to appeal, the decision on defense request for stay of the proceedings and further disclosure, filed on 14 March 2016, is filing 3338. The second one is the defense request for leave to appeal, the decision on defense request for further disclosure, filed on 15 March 2016, filing 3339. The prosecution responded to both requests, submitting that they should be rejected. Filings 3341 and 3342. The legal representative did not respond to either request. Having considered the submissions of the parties, the Chamber has found that the relevant criteria under Article 81 1D of the Rome Statute for leave to appeal to be granted are not met for either request. Accordingly, the Chamber rejects both requests. A written decision containing the reasoning underlying the Chamber's decision will be issued in due course. As you all are aware, we are here today to deliver the summary of the Chamber's judgment pursuant to Article 74 of the Rome Statute, which I will now proceed to read. I would like to remind everyone that today we'll have not only interpretation into French, but also into Lingala and into Sango for the benefit of the people in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Central African Republic. For that reason, I will read the summary of the judgment in a slower pace. And this is the summary of Trial Chambers 3, judgment of 21st March 2016 pursuant to Article 74 of the Rome Statute in the case of the prosecutor versus Mr. Jean-Pierre Bemba-Gombo. One, trial chamber three, the chamber of the International Criminal Court, the court, hereby provides the following summary of today, today's judgment pursuant to Article 74 of the Rome Statute, the statute. The Chamber notes that only the written judgment to be issued after this hearing is authoritative. A, the Chambers, the, uh, the charges against the accused. 
On 24th May 2008, Mr. Jean-Pierre Bemba Gombo, Mr. Bemba, was arrested by the Belgian authorities pursuant to a warrant of arrest issued by the court and was surrendered to the court on 3rd of June 2008. On 15th June 2009, pre-trial chamber two confirmed that there was sufficient evidence to establish substantial grounds to believe that Mr. Bemba is responsible within the meaning of Article 28A for the following crimes alleged to have been committed by MLC soldiers on the territory of the Central African Republic from on or about 26 October 2002 to 15 March 2003. Murder is a crime against humanity under Article 7.1a of the statute. Murder is a war crime under Article 8.2c, Small Roman 1 of the statute. Rape is a crime against humanity under Article 7.1g of the statute. Rape is a war crime under Article 8.2e, Small Roman 6 of the statute. And pillaging is a war crime under Article 8.2e, Small Roman 5 of the statute. Briefcase history. By way of brief case history, the Chamber will first mention key phases of the trial proceedings and the events that had a significant impact on its course. On 22 November 2010, the trial commenced with the parties and participants making their opening statements. The accused pleaded not guilty to each of the five charges. The presentation of evidence commenced on 23rd November 2010, and it initially concluded on 7 April 2014, pursuant to Rule 141, Paragraph 1 of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence. On 2nd October 2014, upon the defense request, the chamber reopened the presentation of evidence for the limited purpose of recalling one witness for further testimony. The further testimony concluded on 24th October 2014. The prosecution, the defense, and the legal representative of victims made their closing oral statements on the 12th and 13th November 2014. On 21st September 2012, the Chamber issued its decision giving notice to the parties and participants that the legal characterization of the facts may be subject to change in accordance with Regulation 55, Paragraph 2 of the Regulations of the Court. On 13th December 2012, the Chamber temporarily suspended the proceedings in order to permit the defense to prepare its case in light of the Regulation 55 notification. On 6 February 2013, at the request of the defense, the Chamber vacated its decision on the temporary suspension of the proceedings. Throughout the proceedings, the Chamber issued 1,219 written decisions, orders, notifications, and cooperation requests, as well as 277 oral decisions and orders. 
the chamber sat for 330 days and heard 77 witnesses, including 40 witnesses called by the prosecution, 34 witnesses called by the defense, two witnesses called by the legal representatives of victims, and one witness called by the chamber. Additionally, the chamber also permitted three victims to present their views and concerns. The chamber admitted a total of 733 items of evidence, including 5,724 pages of documentary evidence. The chamber notes that it granted 5,229 persons the status of victims authorized to participate in the proceedings. The chamber has benefited greatly from the views and concerns of the participating victims as expressed through their legal representatives. The chamber thanks all the victims for their involvement and commends the legal representatives of victims and their team for their contribution. The burden and standard of proof. Under Article 66, Paragraph 1 of the statute, the accused shall be presumed innocent until proved guilty. Pursuant to Article 66, Paragraph 2, the onus is on the prosecution, prosecutor, to prove the accused's guilt. For a conviction, each elements of crimes, contextual elements, and the mode of the liability charged must be established beyond reasonable doubt. The Chamber's main findings. In today's overview of the judgment, the Chamber will first discuss its findings concerning the events in the Central African Rep Republic from on or about 26 October 2002 and 15th March 2003 and its findings in relation to the crimes allegedly committed by MLC soldiers in the Central African Republic during the period of the charges. The Chamber will then turn to its findings as to Mr. Bemba's alleged individual criminal responsibility as a military commander or a person effectively acting as such under Article 28 of the statute. The events in the Central African Republic from on or about 26 October 2002 to 15th March 2003. The Chamber has concluded that the forces loyal to General Francois Bozizé, the former Chief of Staff of the First Armée Centrafricaine, FACA, were composed of various former FACA soldiers and some Chadian nationals. The Chamber refers to the forces supporting General Bozizé as General Bozizé's rebels. General Bozizé's rebels advanced from Chad through the Central African Republic in October 2002. They engaged FACA troops and captured, captured various towns before entering Bangui on 25th October 2002. The FACA soldiers and other forces supporting President Patassé, including the Unité de Sécurité Présidentielle, USP, some Libyan troops and other militias responded with armed force. In order to defend his government, President Patassé requested the assistance of the Mouvement de Libération du Congo, MLC, and its military bra branch, the Armée de Libération du Congo, ALC, from Mr. Bemba. 
The MLC was a movement based in Badolite, the capital of the Equateur Provence, in the north northwest of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, DRC. It was established by Mr. Bemba in 1998 with the goal of overthrowing the government in Kinshasa. Mr. Bemba was the MLC president, commander-in-chief of the ALC, the MLC's figurehead and the source of its main funding goals and aims. In response to President Patase's request, Mr. Bemba deployed ALC troops from the DRC to the Central African Republic to intervene in support of President Patase. The MLC contingent Mr. Bemba deployed to the Central African Republic was comprised of three battalions, totaling around 1,500 men. Initially, two battalions crossed to the Central African Republic at the start of the conflict, while the third was deployed around the end of January 2003. The Chema found that over the course of approximately five months, beginning on 26 October 2002, the MLC troops, with a limited number of FACA forces accompanying them, advanced through various localities in Central African Republic, namely through Bangui to PK-12 and PK-22, and along the Damara Sibut and the bosambele bosangoa axis. They attacked Mungumba, and on or about 15 March 2003, they withdrew back to the DRC through Bangui and other crossing points along the Ubangi River. The chamber refers to this period as the 2002-2003 operation. After the MLC's arrival on 26 October 2002, hostilities in regular use of armed force continued between the forces supporting President Patase and General Bozizé's rebel. In Bangui, at the end of October 2002, along the road to PK-22 in the first half of November 2002, around Damara in early December 2002, along the bosambele bozung axis between mid-December and February 2003, on the road to and around Sibut in late February 2003, and along the bosambele bosango axis in late February or early March 2003. On or about 6 March 2003, the MLC troops began to retreat to, towards Bangui, engaging General Bozizé's rebel along the way until the MLC's complete withdrawal from the Central African Republic on 15th March 2003. Although there were breaks in hostilities, they were not result of a peaceful settlement and were merely temporary lulls in the active engagements between the parties to the conflict. At all times relevant to the charges, there was a resort to armed force and protracted violence between the forces supporting <coughs> President Patase and General Bozizé's rebels. The conflict was confined to the territory of the Central African Repu Republic. The foreign participants were not acting under the overall control of any foreign government, and the evidence demonstrated that it could not be viewed as one in which two or more states opposed each other. <coughs> in light of the evidence above, the Chamber concluded that the conflict in the Central African Republic from on or about 26 October 2002 to 15 March 2003 was an armed conflict between the Central African governmental authorities supported by other forces, including MLC, on the one hand, and on the other, the organized armed group of General Bozizé's rebels. 
The armored conflict was not of an international character, was protracted within the meaning of Article 8 to F, and reached a sufficient level of intensity for the purposes of Articles 8 to D and 8 to F. In addition, the Chamber concluded that the MLC forces committed an attack against the civilian population within the meaning of Article 7, Paragraph 2A. The evidence demonstrated that in, in the course of the 2002-2003 operation, MLC troops committed many acts of pillaging, rape, and murder against civilians over a large geographical area, including in and around Bangui, PK-12, PK-22, Bozum, Damara, Sibut, Bosangua, Bosambele, Dekua, Cagabandoro, Bosemtele, Boali, Yaloke, and Mungumba. The multiple acts of rape and murder committed by MLC soldiers constituted a course of conduct and were not merely isolated or, or random acts. The victims were not taking part in hostilities at the relevant time. MLC soldiers targeted civilians without regard for age, gender, or social status in civilian neighborhoods and residences on temporary MLC bases or in isolated locations, such as the bush. Entire families were victimized. Victims included the elderly, men, women, and children. The acts of murder and rape were regularly committed together with or during the course of the commission of acts of pillaging against the civilian population. The Chamber concluded that the civilian population was the primary as opposed to incidental target of the attack, and in turn, that the attack was directed against the civilian population in the Central African Republic. The Chamber found that although a policy to attack the civilian population in the Central African Republic was not formalized, the existence of such a policy was the only reasonable conclusion from a cumulative consideration of several relevant factors. The Chamber was satisfied that the failure on the part of the MLC to take action was deliberately aimed at encouraging the attack. The Chamber, in fact, found that the AMC, AMLC, in particular through the action of its commanders, on the ground actively in encouraged, encouraged the attack. The Chamber concluded that the evidence demonstrated the existence of a widespread attack by MLC soldiers directed against the Central African civilian population throughout the period of the charges. The crimes committed by MLC soldiers during the conflict. Of the underlining acts of murder, rape, and pillaging, the Chamber found to fall within the scope of the charges and which of which the defense had adequate notice, the Chamber found beyond reasonable doubt that MLC troops knowingly and intentionally killed the following persons. P87's brother in Bangui at the end of October, October 2002. A MLC soldier shot the victim during the MLC's pillaging of the victim's home. P69 sister in PK12 the day after the MLC's arrival in PK12. A AMLC soldier shot the victim in the head when she resisted the pillaging of her money. And an unidentified Muslim man on 5th March 2003 in Mungumba, 
MLC soldiers shot and mutilated the victim when he refused to give them his sheep. MLC soldiers, by force, knowingly and intentionally invaded the bodies of the following victims by penetrating the victim's anuses and or vaginas and or bodily openings with their penises. P-68 and P-68 sister-in-law in Bangui at the end of October 2002. After the victims fled their homes to escape the MLC, they were attacked by MLC soldiers and two of these soldiers raped P-68 while another three raped her sister-in-law. Two unidentified girls aged 12 and 13 years in Bangui on or around 30th October 2002. The two girls were each raped by two MLC soldiers. P87 on and around 30th October 2002, after the pillaging of her home, a MLC soldier forced the victim behind the house, threw her to the ground and raped her. He then called to one of his companions who did the same and then a third soldier raped her as well. Eight unidentified women at the Port Beach Naval Base, base in Bangui at the end of October or beginning of November 2002. A group of MLC soldiers brought the victims onto the deck of a ferry and took turns raping them. P23, P80, P81, P82, and two of P23's other doctors in PK12 in early November 2002. A group of MLC soldiers entered the victim's compound. Three armed soldiers raped P23 in the presence of his family members and neighbor. While holding P-23 at gunpoint, three soldiers raped P-80, P-23's wife. Four soldiers raped P-81, who is P-23's doctor, assaulting her until she bled. A soldier beat P-82, P-23's granddaughter, and then at least two soldiers took turns raping, the, raping her. Another two of P-23's daughters were also raped by MLC soldiers the same day. P-69 and his wife in, P, in PK-12 at the end of November 2002. At least four MLC soldiers raped P-69's wife. When P-69 protested her assault, two soldiers holding the, him at gunpoint proceeded to rape him. P-22 in PK-12 on, on around 6 or 7 November 2002, while pillaging her uncle's house MLC soldiers found the victim and three of them took turns raping her. P-79 and her daughter in PK-12, several days after the MLC arrived in PK-12. While one soldier held P-79 at gunpoint, two others raped her. During the same attack, another soldier raped P-79's daughter in the presence of other children. P-42's daughter in PK-12 around, around the end of November 2002, while pillaging P-42's house, MLC soldiers took his 10-year-old daughter to a small shelter behind the house where he cooed her shouting. Two so soldiers 
raped her. A woman in the bush outside PK-22 in November 2002. Three MLC soldiers attacked the woman. When she resisted, the men ripped off her clothes, pulled her, her legs apart, and all three men raped her. P-29 in Mungumba on 5th March 2003. While she was preparing to flee from the MLC, three MLC soldiers forced the victim back into her house <coughs> and proceeded to rape her. And V1 in Mungumba on 5th March 2003, after forcing her to serve as their interpreter, MLC soldiers raped the victim in two separate incidents. In the first, two soldiers knocked her to the ground and raped her. In the second incident, the victim was raped by 12 soldiers. MLC soldiers knowingly and intentionally appropriated items of property from the following victims for private or personal use without the victim's consent. P68 and her sister-in-law in Bangui at the end of October 2002. <coughs> P119 in Bangui after 30th of October 2002. P87 and her family in Bangui on or around 30th of October 2002. P23 P80, P81, and P82 in Bangui in early November 2002. P69 sisters, sister in PK12, the day after the MLC arrived. P69 in PK12 in November 2002. P108 in PK12 during the MLC presence in the area. P110 in PK12, the day after the MLC arrived. P112 in PK12 in November 2002. P22 and her uncle in PK12 on and around 6 or 7 November 2002. P79 and her brother at PK12 several days after the MLC's arrival. P73 in PK12 at the end of November 2002. P42 in his family in PK12 at the end of November 2002. P75 in the bush outside PK22 in November 2002. V2 in Sibut, in the days after the MLC arrival in that area. And V1, a church, nuns, priests, and an uh, unidentified Muslim man and his neighbor, the gendarmerie in the mayor's house in Mungumba on 5th March 2003. The MLC soldiers took numerous items from the victims, including administrative documents, clothing, furniture, tools, radios, televisions, items of personal value, money, livestock, food, mattresses, vehicles, and fuel. In P42's words, they took everything and some victims were left with nothing. The consequences for victims were far-reaching, impacting various, various aspects of their personal and professional lives. <coughs> the Chamber concluded that MLC soldiers were the perpetrators of the specific underlined acts discussed above. This was based on a cumulative consideration of relevant identification criteria. These include 
the repeated interactions between the victims and witnesses and MLC soldiers, the clothing worn by the perpetrators, the language they spoke, the manner in which the perpetrators identified themselves to the victims, and or troop movements and the presence of the MLC in the relevant locations at the time of the crimes. The chamber was satisfied that the specific underlying acts addressed above are only a portion of the total number of crimes committed in the territory of the Central African Republic by the MLC forces in the course of the 2002-2003 operation. MLC soldiers committed the acts of murder, rape and pillaging against Central African civilians after the soldiers' arrival in a given area in the context, context of the armed conflict between forces loyal to President Patasse and General Bozizé's rebels. The acts of murder, rape and pillaging were committed consistent with evidence of a modus operandi employed by the MLC soldiers in Central African Republic throughout the 2002-2003 conflict. After General Bozizé's rebels had departed an area, MLC soldiers searched house to house for remaining rebels, raping civilians, pillaging their belongings, and on some occasions killing those who resisted. Often, multiple, mul multiple perpetrators were involved in the same incidents of murder, rape, or pillaging. This modus operandi was apparent from the earliest days of the 2002-2003 operation and continued consistently throughout it. The evidence showed that MLC perpetrators targeted the civilians, the victims, in order to self-compensate for inadequate payment and rations from the MLC and or to destabilize, humiliate, or punish suspected rebels, rebel sympathizers, or those who resisted pillaging and rape specifically in relation to the crimes committed during the attack on Mungumba, the chamber concluded <coughs> that the attack was carried out as a punishment and retribution for the seizure of allegedly pillaged goods the MLC soldiers were taken by boat back to the DRC. The chamber found that the armed conflict played a major part in the MLC soldiers' decision to commit the crimes, their ability to do so, and the manner in which the crimes were committed. Further, the chamber concluded that the perpetrators were aware of the factual circumstances that established the existence of an armed conflict, namely the resort to armed force by and protracted <laughs> violence violence between the forces supporting President Patasse and Generals Bozizé's rebels. The chamber also concluded that the underlying acts of murder and rape were committed by the MLC soldiers as part of an attack against the civilian population in the Central African Republic in the context of the 2002-2003 operation. Further, the chamber found that the perpetrators had knowledge of the attack and knew that their conduct was or intended their conduct to be part of the widespread attack directed against the civilian population. The chamber thus found beyond reasonable doubt that the MLC soldiers committed the war crimes of murder, rape, and pillaging within the meaning of Articles 8, 2, C, Small Roman 1, 8, 2, E, Small Roman 6, 
and 8.2e small Roman 5 of the Rome yeah. Statute. And the crimes against humanity of murder and rape within the meaning of Article 7.1a and 7.1g of the statute. Now we turn to Mr. Bamba's responsibility within the meaning of Article 28 of the statute. A, Mr. Bamba effectively acted as a military commander and had effective authority and control over the MLC forces that committed the crimes. Mr. Bemba was the president of the MLC and commander in chief of the ALC from its creation and throughout the period of the charges. The members of the MLC Political and Military Council discussed certain issues with Mr. Bemba, but the evidence shows that he was the primary authority covering both the political and military spheres and took, in general, the most important decisions. Mr. Bemba held broad formal powers, ultimate decision-making authority, and powers of appointment, promotion, and dismissal within the MLC and its military branch. Mr. Bemba additionally controlled the MLC's funding. He had direct lines of communication to commanders in the field and a well-established <coughs> reporting system. He received operational and technical advice from the MLC general staff. Mr. Bemba both could and did issue operational orders. He had disciplinary powers of MLC members, including the power to initiate inquiries and establish courts martial, and had the ability to send troops or to withdraw them from the Central African Republic. The MLC forces, including the contingent in the Central African Republic, communicated and cooperated with the Central African authorities throughout the 2002 and 2003 operation. However, the Chamber found that the MLC troops were not resubordinated to the Central African military hierarchy, insofar as this would imply that Mr. Bemba's authority over the MLC contingent in the car was displaced. The entirety of the evidentiary record showed that Mr. Bemba exercised effective control over the MLC contingent in the Central African Republic at all relevant times. Mr. Bemba ordered the initial deployment of the MLC troops to the Central African Republic, including in consultation with the MLC general staff selecting the units and commanders to be deployed. Following deployment, Mr. Bema maintained regular contact directly with senior commanders in the field on the state of operations and additionally received numerous detailed operations and intelligence reports. Further, the MLC hierarchy in the DRC controlled by Mr. Bemba, continued to provide logistical support and equipment to the MLC troops in the Central African Republic. The Chamber found that Mr. Bemba issued direct operational orders. These orders were relayed and implemented by Colonel Mustafa Mukiza, the highest ranking MLC officer in the Central African Republic during the 2002 2003 operation, and the senior officer at the brigade level. Further, significantly, the chamber found that Mr. Bemba retained primary disciplinary authority over the MLC troops in the Central African Republic, including through the establishment of commissions of inquiry, powers of arrest, <coughs> and the convening of courts martial. 
The ALC Code of Conduct also applied to the NLC contingent in the Central African Republic throughout the 2002-2003 operation. Mr. Bemba also retained the power and authority to order the withdrawal of the MLC troops in the Central African Republic. Once Mr. Bemba actually ordered the withdrawal of the troops, the decision was complied with. In light of the evidence as a whole, the Chamber concluded that Mr. Bemba was both a person effectively acting as a military commander and had effective authority and control over the contingent of MLC troops in the Central African Republic throughout the 2002 and 2003 operation. B, Mr. Bemba knew that the MLC forces were committing or about to commit the crimes. Throughout the 2002-2003 operation, Mr. Bemba was predominantly based in DRC, where the MLC was also headquartered, and was therefore remote from the operations on the ground. However, radios, satellite phones, <coughs> thurias, mobile telephones, and other communications equipment enabled MLC commanders in the Central African Republic to communicate directly with Mr. Bemba, the MLC Chief of General Staff, and the MLC headquarters in Badolite. <coughs> through such channels of communication and throughout the 2002-2003 operation, there was regular and direct communication between Mr. Bemba and Colonel Mustafa with Colonel Mustafa reporting the status of operations and the situation on the ground. Other MLC officials in the Central African Republic were also in direct contact with Mr. Bemba by radio or Thuraya. In addition to direct communication with Mr. Bemba, Colonel Mustafa and other commanders in the Central African Republic were in direct contact with the MLC Chief of Gen General Staff, who reported information he received to Mr. Bemba. Likewise, messages sent by the MLC commanders in the Central African Republic through the MLC Transmission Center in Badolite were recorded in logbooks, which were taken, then taken to Mr. Bemba. Military and civilian intelligence services also provided Mr. Bemba, either directly or through the general staff, with information on the combat situation, troop positions, politics, and allegations of crimes. Significantly, such intelligence reports refer to various acts perpetrated by Banyamulenges, or MLC troops, including theft, pillaging, rape, the killing of civilians, harassment of persons, and the transportation of looted goods, including trucks for Colonel Mustafa, back to the DRC through Zongo and Libengi. From the early days of 2002-2003 operation, Mr. Bemba followed and discussed international media reports with senior MLC soldiers. These reports also often included his personal reactions to allegations of crimes committed by MLC soldiers. Over the course of the 2002-2003 operation, local and international media and other sources reported allegations of many acts of rape, pillaging and murder by MLC soldiers in the Central African Republic, including in and around Bangui, PK-12, PK-22, Bozum, Damara, Sibut, Bosangoa, Bosambele, 
Tecoa, Cagamandoro, Bosemtele, Boali, Yaloke, and Mungumba. Mr. Bemba also visited the Central African Republic on a number of occasions. As early as November 2002, after hearing reports of crimes committed by MLC soldiers, Mr. Bemba traveled to the Central African Republic. There, he met with the UN representative in the Central African Republic, General Sisse, and President Patasi, and later addressed MLC troops and Central African Republic civilians at PK-12. During his speech, at PK-12, Mr. Bemba referred to the MLC troops' misbehavior, stealing and brutalizing of Central African Republic civilian population. Several steps taken by Mr. Bemba in relation to allegations of crimes by MLC soldiers also demonstrate his knowledge of the allegations. The Mondonga inquiry was established to investigate allegations of crimes. It uncovered information on acts of pillaging and rape attributed to MLC soldiers in the initial days of the 2002 and 2003 operation. During the subsequent publicly broadcast Badolit court martial of the soldiers investigated, Mr. Bemba continued to receive information of further allegations of pillaging by MLC soldiers. Similarly, the investigative Zongo Commission was sent to Zongo in the DRC to collect information related to the allegations that pillaged goods <coughs> from the Central African Republic were entering the DRC through Zongo. The Zongo Commission's report included information indicating that, that pillaging had been committed by MLC soldiers during the 2002-2003 operations, and that pillaged items had been transported from the Central African Republic to the DRC. In January 2003, in correspondence with the General Sisi, Mr. Bemba noted some allegations concerning crimes committed by MLC soldiers in the Central African Republic. Further, a report by the Fédération Internationale des Ligues des Droits de l'Homme, FIDH report, was released on 13 February 2003 and concerned an investigative mission in Bangui. The FIDH report included detailed accounts of alleged acts of murder rape and pillaging by MLC soldiers against Central African civilians in Inter Alia, Bangui, PK-12 and PK-22. In a letter to the FIDH president dated 20 February 2003, Mr. Bemba noted the FIDH report which contained allegations of human rights violations by MLC soldiers. The Sibut mission was sent to Sibut at the end of February 2003. In relation to media reports of MLC abuses against the civilian population in Sibut and Bozum, some of the people interviewed by reporters on the mission claimed that MLC soldiers committed abuses against civilian population in Sibut, in particular pillaging. Finally, in March 2003, Mr. Bemba knew of and did not take any preventative or remi remedial action, remedial action in relation to the punitive attack on Mungumba, where only civilians were present at the time. He was in constant contact with Colonel Mustafa the day before and the day of the attack. In light of the evidence as a whole, the Chamber concluded that throughout the 2002-2003 operation, Mr. Bemba knew that MLC forces and his effective authority and control were committing or about to commit the crimes against humanity of murder and rape and the war crimes of murder, rape, and pillaging. 
Having so found, the chamber did not consider that the re characterization of the charges pursuant to regulation 55 of the regulations of the court to include the should have known mental element was warranted. C, Mr. Bema failed to take all necessary and reasonable measures to prevent or repress the commission of the crimes or to submit the matter to competent authorities for investigation and prosecution. The chamber concluded that, despite consistent information as reported internally within the MLC and externally in the media, the acts of murder, rape and pillaging attributed to MLC soldiers throughout the 2002-2003 operation, Mr. Bemba's reactions were limited to, one, general public warnings to his troops not to mistreat the civilian population. Second, the creation of the two <coughs> above mentioned investigative commissions. Three, the Badolite court martial of seven low ranking soldiers on charges of pillaging of goods of limited <coughs> value. And fourth, the Sibut mission, which was not even an investigation. The mandates of the two investigative commissions were limited to the following <coughs> allegations. Pillaging committed in the initial days of the 2002-2003 operation in Bangui and pillaged goods being transported via Zongo. Further to noting that the measures set out above were not properly and sincerely executed, the Chima found that the measures Mr. Bemba took were a grossly inadequate response to the consistent information of widespread crimes committed by the MLC soldiers in the Central African Republic, of which Mr. Bemba had knowledge. There is no evidence that Mr. Bemba took any measures in response to information transmitted internally within the MLC of crimes by MLC soldiers from, for example, the MLC Intelligence Service or the leads uncovered during the Mongomba, uh, Mondonga Inquiry, Zongo Commission, or Sibut Mission. In addition to, or instead of the insufficient measures Mr. Bemba did take, and in light of his extensive material ability to prevent and repress the crimes, Mr. Bemba could have inter alia ensured that the MLC troops in Central African Republic were properly trained in the rules of international humanitarian law and adequately supervised during the 2002-2003 operation. Initiated genuine and full investigations into the commission of crimes <coughs> and properly tried and punished any <coughs> soldiers and commanders alleged of having committed crimes. Issued further and clear orders to the commanders of the troops in the Central African Republic to prevent the commission of crimes. Altered the deployment of the troops, for example, to minimize contact with the civilian population. Removed, replaced, or dismissed officers and soldiers found <coughs> to have committed or condoned any crimes in Central African Republic. Shared relevant information with the Central African Republic authorities or others and supported them in any efforts to investigate criminal allegations. And or withdrawn MLC troops from the Central African Republic prior to the actual withdrawal in March 2003. In light of the wide range of al available measures at his disposal, <coughs> the chamber found that the measures Mr. Bemba did take fell patently short of all necessary and reasonable measures to prevent and, re and repress the commission of crimes within his material ability. Finally, the chamber noted that as he had ultimate disciplinary authority of the MLC contingent in the Central African Republic, Mr. Bemba was the competent authority to investigate 
and prosecute the crimes. In such circumstances, where he failed to empower other MLC officials to fully and adequately <coughs> investigate and prosecute allegations of crimes, he cannot be said to have submitted the matter to the competent authorities for investigation and prosecution. He also made no effort to refer the matter to the Central African Republic authorities or to meaningfully cooperate with international efforts to investigate the crimes, despite assertions that he would do so, in particular <coughs> in his correspondence with <coughs> General Sissé and with the FIDH president. Accordingly, in light of the above considerations and the evidence as a whole, the chamber found that Mr. Bemba failed to take all necessary and reasonable measures to prevent or repress the commission of crimes by his subordinates during the 2002-2003 operation or to submit the matter to the competent authorities. D, as a result of Mr. Bemba's failure to exercise control properly over the MLC troops. Despite Mr. Bemba's effective authority and control over the ALC, including authority over disciplinary <coughs> matters, he failed to take any measures to remedy deficiencies in training, either prior to the deployment of the troops or in response to the consistent reports of crimes occurring from the earliest days of 2002-2003 operation. Additionally, Mr. Bemba's failure to take all necessary and reasonable measures to prevent and repress the commission of the crimes or to submit the matter to the competent authorities demonstrated that Mr. Bemba failed to exercise control properly over the forces deployed to the Central African Republic. The Chamber concluded that, as demonstrated by the measures Mr. Bemba did take in response to allegations of crimes, including on Central African territory in the midst of the 2002-2003 operation. And despite his remote location, Mr. Bemba had the authority and ability to take measures to prevent and repress the commission of crimes. Taking these measures would have deterred the commission of crimes and generally diminished, if not eliminated, the climate of acquiescence, which is inherent where troops <coughs> have inadequate training, receive unclear <coughs> orders, and or observe their commanders committing or collaborating in crimes, surrounding and facilitating the crimes committed during the 2002-2003 operation. Mr. Bemba failures in this regard directly contributed to the continuation and further commission of crimes. The Chamber <coughs> concluded that the crimes against humanity of murder and rape and the war crimes of murder, rape and pillaging committed by the MLC forces in the course of the 2002-2003 operation were a result of Mr. Bemba's failure to exercise control properly over his troops in light of the evidence analyzed as a whole, the Chamber found beyond reasonable doubt <coughs> that Mr. Bemba is criminally responsible under Article 28A for the crimes against humanity of murder and rape and the war crimes of murder, rape and pillaging committed in the territory of the Central African Republic by the MLC forces in the course of 2002-2003 operations. Although judges Steiner and Ozaki have written separate opinions on discrete legal issues, the Chamber has reached its decision unanimously. For the reasons provided in the judgment rendered today, and relying pursuant to Article 74.2 of the statute, on the evidence submitted and discussed at trial, and on the entire proceedings, the Chamber finds Mr. Jean-Pierre Bemba Gombo guilty under Article 28A of the statute 
as a person effectively acting as a military commander for the following crimes. Murder as a war crime under Article 7 1A of the statute. Murder as a war, sorry, murder as a crime against humanity under Article 7 1A of the statute. Murder as a war crime under Article 8 2C, small Roman 1 of the statute. Rape as a crime against humanity under Article 7 1G of the statute. Rape as a war crime under Article 82E, <coughs> Small Roman 6 of the Statute. And pillaging as a war crime under A Article 82E, Small Roman 5 of the Statute. Consequently, the Chamber decides that Mr. Jean Pierre Bembagombo shall remain in detention until such time as the, as the sentence is passed and orders the Victims and Witnesses Unit to take all necessary measures to ensure the protection of victims and witnesses pursuant to Article 68 of the statute. The full judgment will be notified shortly after this oral summary concludes. An order on the sentences, uh, sentencing submission timeline will also be issued later today. Issues related to the reparations procedure will be addressed in due course. With that, the Chamber concludes the reading of the summary of the judgment pursuant to Article 74 of the statute. The Chamber thanks everyone present for your kind attention. The Chamber would also like to thank the entire staff of the registry, including court officers, the interpreters, the court reporters, and all dedicated members of the registry staff who assisted us in this hearing and made it possible for us to conduct the entire trial. The Chamber would also like to thank everyone in the Chamber who assisted the judges throughout the proceedings, our legal advisors, the, the legal advisor, our legal officers, our assistant legal officers here present, our research assistant, and our interns and visiting professionals, whose contribution to the chamber's work throughout this trial has been essential. This hearing is concluded. All rise. Leave a little bit.